Yeah, thanks, Sue. Um, and good afternoon, afternoon everybody. Um, the last webinar was all about contracts, and we looked, first of all, at the economic contract, the kind of idea that uh, people sign a contract and say, in return for giving you my labor, I expect from you a wage. And that very basic one, which then gets embellished, gets built uh, to become what we know as the psychological contract. The essence is that no economic or legal contract is that clear to be absolutely definitive about the way the two parties will behave. And therefore, an awful lot of the behavior, uh, a lot of the expect, uh, the, 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 um, the way that the two parties will get on, that is to say the company and the employee, is balled up in the psychological contract. It's, it's a bunch of expectations. And what we're going to do today is to take that to the next level. We're going to take that to the next um, stage of thinking. Um, and we're going to cover the subjects of commitment and engagement. And of course, the reason why we're doing it is we're in search, ultimately, of performance. Um, and so both of those, commitment and engagement, take management energy. They're two totally different concepts. People bandy them around as if they're the same. They're not. Two totally different concepts. Um, and they both take management energy. And I'm going to be asking a few questions of you to think about whether or not ultimately, um, when it comes to engagement, whether it's necessary in everyone. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go. So away we go. The fundamental is that we're in search of performance. And a lot of the, the performance, ultimately, the commitments and engagement, is going to be about how we treat employees. Yes, yes, there is an economic contract that says, I'll turn up and you'll pay me. But actually, the way people behave and in search of good performance, it all depends on how the, the employees are treated. And of course, ultimately, therefore, what the firm expects of them. So there's this kind of two-way expectation. But the concept of human capital index is, is a kind of an index being a measure is just something that has been kicking around in research for quite a while. Certainly since about 2008, there was a, a big paper on it, and out came this thing called Human Capital Index. And it's a measure, effectively a measure of how we're doing uh, in how we're treating the people. How we're treating the people, and therefore ultimately, are the people going to achieve excellence? Are they going to achieve performance? And this gives you an idea here. This is, you'll see the reference on it on our, on our website, timelesstime.co.uk slash tools slash HR contributor assessor. And the, the human capital index is the uh, contribution that the people will make um, and whether or not you're getting it right. And if you nip around this, you see at the top there, uh, there's a load of questions in the um, in the the uh, inventory on our website that asks, how are you doing about recruitment? Um, and you'll see the outside, the morph color is the ideal firm. Uh, it's, out of, uh, it's out of seven, and um, some of the indices are, but some of them are less. So it's a bit of, a, a, a bit of a, an irregular shape. But the morph, tri morph um, um, uh, shape there is the ideal. And you'll see, I've just put some figures in and you've got this company here is scoring about two point something out of seven. So in terms of getting the right people to the right jobs, it's not doing very well, this company. I just went through and bashed a load of numbers in. So, so it's a lot, rather random, but you see the idea. On management and leadership, it's doing even worse. It's doing terribly. It's got point something out of uh, scoring out of four point. I think the maximum there is 4.7. So you can see, though, that what we can do is we can assess, and you can go through it yourselves, and you can assess how we're doing. How's the company doing when it comes to recruitment, management and leadership, pay and benefits, uh, staff development, and what's called focused retention is, is really – um, getting the right people in and, should I say, the wrong people out. Uh, that sounds terrible. You shouldn't have recruited them in the first place. But retaining the skills, retaining the knowledge, retaining the, the competencies that people that are actually needed in the company. Um, so that gives you an idea. The first thing then is saying, okay, 
how are we doing in treating people? Are we along the road towards commitment? And that begs the question, um, what is commitment? And commitment is is a psychological um, concept. It's, it's what's going on in the employee's mind. It's how they feel about the way they're being treated. And in return for that, they will make, and what is termed open or closed, private, promises about their intention to stay with the company and devote their time and energy to the company. So be very clear there, the commitment is the making of a promise. So you quietly say, if you're the employee, I am going to stay. I intend to stay and I'm going to put my energies, I'm going to devote my time and energy to this company. And that's the first simple concept of commitment. Now, commitment is considered to be um, to fall into three categories. The first is, and these are just statements, if you imagine these promises that I've described as if you're making, the first is, I want to continue to work here. The second is, I'm obligated to continue to work here. And the third is, I need to keep working here. Now, these three are very different, and they the, the, there's, there's a simple difference, and that is that the first one is in, in, engaging the emotions. The, the next two are more like that, that economic uh, ar arrangement. So, for example, I need to work here. Simple reason, I don't like working here particularly, but I've got a mortgage, so I need to stay. That's one form of commitment. Yes, I need to stay. The other one is I'm obligated to stay, and that's in some fashion or other, you've entered a contract, um, and that contract binds you in some way to, to stay. And those two are quite, if you like, quite weak, whereas I want to continue to work here is emotional. And that is the ultimate. That's what all managers are striving to have. All managers want their people to quietly say to themselves, or indeed to openly say to colleagues, I want to be here. I want to stay. And of course, the minute somebody wants to stay, many, many other things become possible. Other forms of management become possible. It becomes possible to invoke leadership. You can't lead people who are not committed. So first, you've got to get people who want to be there. Then you can invoke leadership. And commitment is for managers to win. It's not automatic. Yes, they'll turn up because they're obligated to do so under the contract, the economic contract. But that doesn't mean they want to be there. And it doesn't mean that those other management interventions are possible. So it comes in three forms. And it comes as a result, fundamentally, of meeting the, the basic needs of the person. So uh, it also means building respect or gaining respect from managers so uh, and, and gaining managers' trust. Of course, as soon as those are damaged, get the, the minute trust and respect is damaged, then commitment is damaged. And of course, there's the expectation of fair treatment. And if the person doesn't get fair, fair treatment, then that commitment will be damaged. And that then is to be won. Now, I, I've tried to put this on a, on a continuum and to try to give it a little bit more substance. In other words, what are we talking about here? What is this? How do we conceptualize it? And it's all about relating motivation to performance. If at the beginning someone is lightly, shall we say, motivated, uh, they've turned up and they're making themselves available for work, they're committed, they say, yes, I want to be here, then the chances are they're going to start performing. They're going to do things that, if you like, will give us a degree of performance. As they become more motivated, and we'll come to motivation, it's not about motivation today, but we'll come to motivation. But um, a little bit about motivation, they, they, sorry, they become a little bit motivated, the performance increases. And then as they engage more and more with the job, and we'll look at that in a moment, um, then so they become engaged. And engagement is sometimes called super motivation. Uh, it's the next level of motivation. And of course, we've all heard that as people become so motivated, particularly, for example, let's say uh, uh, academic research has become so motivated 
the uh, the performance is superb, but the danger is that they run out of physical and mental resources and they just can't keep it up. They can't keep the performance up and they go into burnout. But that's not a concern today. What we're interested in is first we get commitment, then we start getting people motivated, then we start they start to get engaged with the job. So engagement is with the job. It's not with the firm. The firm is the commitment. They're committed to the firm. They get motivated, start working, and then they begin to become engaged with the job. Um, So what's needed in order to get engaged? Well, engagement with the job comes, here we've got the job, and Many of you will have seen this uh, construction before. You've got the job with its work variety and its significance, etc. And those are the motivators. Those five, um, actually, one, two, three, four, five, six, those six, um, (laughs) those six there um, are giving us the motivation. The job is the primary motivation. That clicks the motivation. The motivation causes behavior. Behavior causes performance. And away we go. So. We're getting motivated and we perform. Now, as the person performs, so they achieve. And the more they achieve, the more motivated, provided that that um, performance is meeting, that that is is tapping their explicit motives, their externally expressed motives, for example, for achieving objectives then the more they achieve, the more motivated they become. And you see there that because you've got that cycle, that's why it is that some people can become so motivated that they burn up. Um, But in essence, the first thing for performance, for, um, sorry, engagement, is is to, for people to recognize their achievements and be recognized for their achievements. The second thing is for them to learn. Now, that assumes that they're open to learning. It's assuming that they want to learn. And that assumes that they have um, a reasonable growth need strength, that they're not people who just simply turn up. Of course, if they turn up and achieve, they will still achieve engagement. But other people will achieve their engagement by tapping the implicit or internal motives um, and by learning. So there are two different opportunities there for managers. The first is to stoke that learning loop by giving opportunities for further learning. And the other opportunity for managers is to stoke that achievement loop by giving them more opportunities to achieve. And so that's, in essence, how engagement occurs. Engage with the job. It's not engaged particularly with the company. You can see everything that's on the screen so far is is everything to do with the job as distinct from the way they're treated um, to be associated with with the company. Now, this assumes that the job is right for the person. That then means that there's a huge onus, a huge role here in recruitment. And not everybody will respond in this way. Not everybody will be respond to uh, um, engagement. Some people we must recognize will work uh, in in a simply be instrumental. Work for them is instrumental. They turn up, they do a job. They're in the commitment and and motivation. They're not looking, they're not particularly engaged with their job. And we could argue that that's fine. There are a lot of people who maybe we don't need them to be engaged. We don't need that extra level of motivation, and therefore we don't need that extra level of performance. Uh, And that's a discussion because managers must realize that to get people engaged takes management energy. It takes effort to make that happen. It's not something that just clicks in. But the first start, the start point is at recruitment. And the fundamental there is getting the right person into the right job. Uh, That might sound a bit obvious, but recruitment is often done very badly. We start, many managers start by not really understanding what the job they're trying to get the person to do is. You know, we go out and we want another salesman, so we get another salesman. 
okay, are we sure that that's the right job? And we say, oh, well, it's a, uh, I heard the term the other day uh, from a manager, it's a smile and dial job, um, except that when we actually started to look at it, concept incidentally by smile and dial, of course, is that you simply sit somebody at a desk, give them a telephone and they make calls. But what we actually understood uh, later was that it was it was a uh, consultative sale activity, and what you needed was a technical specialist who could work with the the clients to be able to solve problems. So the danger was this customer, uh, in this case it's our customer, um, was going to go away and potentially recruit the wrong person. So we have to be sure we get the right person for the right job. Otherwise, we're not going to be tapping all these things that we need to tap to get uh, starting commitment into motivation and most especially into uh, engagement. Um, so we have to get the right person. If we've got the right person and we've got the right job and things are swimming, going along swimmingly, what helps and the answer, of course, by the very what I've just put up is the fact that our human resource practices are going to be rather fundamental to sustaining first commitment and then enabling this process of, of engagement. So HR processes start life by in, enabling commitment and enabling, if we get the job right through job de job design, enabling motivation, and of course, then enabling through training and development and the likes, so enabling engagement. But let's just take a look. And here's another model. This is termed the Bath model after Bath University, because they did some stuff in this, effectively saying, well, what HR practices contribute to commitment? And ultimately on to motivation. And this is just slightly a slightly different way. You still see performance here, but they're just putting it in a slightly different form. So you still see performance, uh, you still see, see behavior, but here they've they've got this box called ability, motivation, and opportunity. And we're particularly interested in the motivation side. And that then leads us feeding into that to to, to cause motivation are all the HR practices. And I'll just spin around them the first is is job security. If it's if people recognise that the job's not particularly s secure, maybe because the company has a, a habit of hire and fire uh, or the likes, then that's going to hit motivation. That's going to hit commitment. Performance appraisal in it enhances commitment because the person is made to feel special. The employee is made to be, feel special. They have time with their manager to talk about their performance, et cetera, et cetera. Recruitment and selection, we've talked about getting the right person in. Training and development, clearly important on engagement. But if the person is, uh, employees is, is trained for the job, their skills and knowledge are enhanced, that in turn boosts motivation. Career opportunities, similarly. And then we spin around the other side, uh, involvement with team working, because people like to work in, in teams. Uh, involvement, excuse me, I'm just going to cough. Right, sorry about that. Um, and uh, people are working in teams and they get a lot out of that. So in turn, hitting, um, they like the team that they work in, so they're committed. Involvement, communication, they know what's going on in the company, uh, right through um, the job, the job giving motivation, of course, pay satisfaction. The pay satisfaction typically is is more commitment is is completely devastated if there is a lack of satisfaction. That does not mean high pay, absolutely not. And we could go on all day on pay, but it does not mean high pay. Um, and it means having relatively uh, between others in the company having the right pay for the job, and then ultimately work-life balance. So what we're getting at here is that HR practices play. If we get the wrong, our HR practices wrong, then we will not hit commitment. We will not then enable motivation, and we will not ultimately enable uh, engagement. So it shows the importance simply there of HR. And what about management? The manager clearly creates the environment 
creates the job and controls the way the company treats its people. So fundamentally, management as a subject and the manager as a person are all important. So what does the manager do? How does it work? Well, you'll have seen this before. This is the feedback management feedback control model. In essence, what you've got is a reference performance. Incidentally, the reason why performance is focused on so much is because it's the thing that you sense. You, it's difficult to You can't sense somebody's motivation. You can't sense somebody's commitment unless they make an open promise. It's difficult to sense engagement. Uh, you can ask them questions for sure, and there are inventories for doing that and ways of doing it. But fundamentally, you see, the manager sees the reference performance. Is this what I want? If the perf measured performance or the assessed performance is below the reference performance, the performance the manager has in mind, then that triggers the what I've called here the intervention developer and triggers an intervention. The manager then um, tickles, if you like, does something, intervenes in the employee's life and changes their performance. And it could be, you know, we're not going to go into the details here because we've talked about this an awful lot, but it could be something as simple as invoking performance uh, uh, appraisal, um, maybe uh, making some more money available for training. That then, that intervention is then a training intervention that changes the performance. Uh, and we, we, we can then ask as a manager, why did that happen? Why has the performance changed? Have we changed the job? Have we given the person uh, more self self confidence as a result of this, and therefore has self confidence allowed motivation, and has it gone on to allow us to have engagement? So, the, important to just recognise the the uh, relevance here of the feedback, the manager control model, the the manager acting to drive those three things that we're looking for. So there we are. Um, that's the the. Uh, we come to the end. Um, we've looked last time at contracts, the economic and psychological. We've said that economic is too difficult. You can't simply say to somebody, do that, they do it, they get paid. Life is not that simple, uh, and we know that. Um, otherwise, we, everybody would be automatons. That's very much the world of the economist where everyone behaves rationally. People don't behave rationally. People behave, uh, people react to psychological, um, in a psychological way. And it's a lot about how employees feel. That feeling then engenders desire to commit to the company and engage with the, com with the job ultimately. Um, and, in, and go into a state of super motivation, beyond ordinary motivation, where they're really enjoying their job, they're getting a lot of job satisfaction, um, and they're achieving, and they're learning. And that gives us, ultimately, job engagement. Where we, The reason for doing this, of course, is that ultimately we want the highest performance that we can realistically get from that person. And that's why, as a manager, we desire to win staff commitment and we desire to gain job engagement from the employee. And there we go. Back to Sue.